Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming uh, to this talk. I'm really excited. I was really excited until a few minutes ago when I got really nervous, but um, I'm still excited to talk to you about this work that I actually made um, as I was, uh, you know, I learned a lot about what I did in talking to Lillian about <laughs> my, uh, my work. And it, it was sort of a project that I had in mind um, instead of, you know, pieces that we just put together. Um, I went with a, a bit of a mission and uh, let's see. Okay, so um, before I went to Sweden, um, I was very interested in um, Northern light. And this came out of a, you know, very long um, winding um, reaction to the pandemic. Um, I started painting as a, I started as a landscape painter. My very first painting class was, you know, outside um, in farmlands, uh, in uh, Northern New York, near the border of uh, Canada. So um, my first experiences painting were outside actually. Um, and I've always found it thrilling. Um, I studied architecture as Lillian mentioned. And one of the things I loved so much about architecture was um, designing space and designing the space in response to um, my appreciation of the outdoors and trying to bring that inside and my appreciation of, you know, design and interior space and trying to, um, bring that outside, um, in harmony. So, um, as a landscape painter, um, you know, I get very excited by the space and the light because those are the things that have always interested me almost no matter what I'm doing. Um, so in the pandemic, you know, being in my studio apartment in New York City, um, one day, you know, it was very isolating. And one day I was walking down the street, having not talked to anybody <laughs> in months. And um, it was becoming summer. And I looked at, or it had been summer for a while, um, all of June. And I looked out uh, to my left. I'm on the Upper West Side. And I saw this amazing pink sky with these really deep red zigzagging, like, shapes like cutting through it and I whatever I was doing um probably just taking a walk I sort of dropped everything and ran over to the water and because I wanted to see this thing in full and I kind of missed it um I missed the I got glimpses of it it looked fantastic and I you know I, I was a little bit too late so um that was an extremely profound moment in my life um because I had nothing really on my plate during the pandemic in the beginning. And I remember thinking tomorrow night, I'm gonna set my whole day up to make sure I'm there um, when that sun starts setting. And so for the rest of the month of July and August, months of July and August, I went out every single night and painted the sunset. And it, it you know, um, it was like one of the, most original, beautiful shows I've ever seen. And I couldn't believe it was happening every day. Every day was so different. It was so powerful. I enjoyed painting really fast. I enjoyed how it changed so dramatically every second. Um, and I would set my, you know, I would look at my weather.com app and every day I noticed that the sunset was changing in time, like by like half a minute, half a minute. I got very invested in the path of the sun um, and you know how it um, how it changes during seasons. So I knew I wanted to go um, explore an area where it was more dramatic, um, where there was a more extreme situation, and that is the northern hemisphere um, and the midnight sun. Or so I thought this was the best idea. Um, I started preparing by painting um, my idea of what the midnight sun would look like. And this is one of my paintings. Uh, it's very large. Um, and uh, I had a friend come visit me from Sweden, or not visit me, but she came from Sweden and we had a nice talk and she was visiting New York and we were talking about the, um, you know, the midnight sun. And, and she was sort of letting me know that there was more like scientific, 
um, biological consequences, you know, from that constant light. And it just made me even more curious. And she very generously allowed me to stay at her place while she went on a really nice vacation to Hawaii. <laughs> um, I stayed at her place and um, in Bolnas, which is right here. And Stockholm is here. So it's about three hours north. Um, and then all these hearts pretty much are where I traveled around. Um, I started off my trip in Stockholm and this was the very first night I got there, um, 9.30 maybe at night. And I took this kind of unremarkable photograph because I was so amazed at how bright it was um, so late at night. Um, this body of work I made is a combination of work I brought, you know, I made in my studio when I got back from Sweden and work that I did while I was in Sweden. My goal was to just go there and live in it in real life, experience this and just make an object out of it while I was there and then come home and make, I thought of it like an object, like an object of my experience. Um, and this pretty much sums it up. Um, I, one of the main, um, goals I had in my studio work was to, is one of my favorite things to do, because I do love painting figuratively, is to balance landscape and figuration um, so that the psychology of the human being doesn't take over the painting, what, which in this case, I'm not sure. But that's basically was my whole goal during this entire um, time. When I was in Sweden, I was just simply, um, this is later that night. So this is the lightness of the nighttime. Um, uh, near where I was staying in Stockholm. Um, this, these are shots like when I would be out in Stockholm and then I'd be like, oh, whoa, it's 10 o'clock, I should go home um, or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it was very interesting living in this. Um, the skies were always very, very dramatic. I'm not sure if that's always the case there. I'm gonna go back and get to know the landscape better, but because of that, um, you know, I, of course, love that. And um, this is a piece I made in my studio, actually. Um, and here I am um, playing with uh, the figuration and the landscape and, you know, how much of the figure should I show so that it doesn't overpower? You know, how much of uh, the person in the figure should I reveal? Um, you know, I need to balance, in my mind, maybe it's an architectural thing, but I just wanted to balance everything, but also create the strongest tension I could. Um, this is the train station. This is how you print, uh, spell bonus. <laughs> um, a very small little town. I did a lot of these little plein air paintings there. This is just to give you, it, they're also behind me, um, an idea of the scale. Like this one here is like five inches maybe. And I just, I brought a bunch of masonite boards with me and then I bought all my paint in Stockholm and brushes and stuff. Um, I tried to do nighttime and daytime and just sort of observe the differences, mornings. Um, this is the lake that was near my house. <laughs> I was staying in, a, a ta in town over a bookstore. My friend had a beautiful apartment there. And um, yeah, this was every morning I would walk to the lake and it was like this all the time. The sky was like just tremendous. It was the thing about Sweden that I learned was that it's not necessarily the most like, it's not a landscape that I maybe have never imagined before. And that's why it was so spectacular. It was just simply spectacular in its purity um in it's just blue skies and green horizon lines and you know blue uh waters there's a lot of lakes and so um i basically drove around um and just stopped wherever it's the mood struck me <laughs> i did a bunch of paintings of this that there's a lot of paintings that obviously aren't in the show and aren't in this presentation um this is the same lake at night. Um, I would take walks. Everyone was always out. There was also a camping ground nearby. It was a wonderful, you know, Sweden's so lovely because everyone really worships 
the nature there. And um, if I didn't know that I wasn't Swedish, I would almost wonder if I was, because I just felt like, oh, this is definitely me. Um, so these, uh, you know, it rained a lot when I was first there. Um, these are, um, you know, I love painting trees um, and water and sky. And uh, these are some of the, I want to show you some of the landscape that I was looking at. This is an evening. Um, and this is one of my quick paintings. These paintings are pretty quick that I did. Um, and I think I adapted a quick painting skill from all the many sunsets that I painted on the Hudson River. Um, you know, the sky is changing a lot and it's just, you know, so much fun to know when to let go and when to, you know, wildly change something. Um, when to take a chance is never a sure bet. Um, this is a very small painting, just, you know, I was driving down the road going somewhere to paint and I saw this little mountain and I, you know, at a certain point I had to stop painting because I had to ship up, you know, bring all this stuff back with me on the airplane. Um, and I think this might be the last painting I made. And I was like, don't paint, you know, you go, <laughs> you, you're never going to be able to get these home. And I just couldn't stop. Um, now I was the last one, I think. Um, the trees just blew me away in the forest areas. Um, I'd never seen, I don't think I've ever seen trees that were just so tall, so straight, um, so bare. Um, they were two-toned with their bark and the um, raw tops. Um, the floor, this isn't a great photo to show you of the floor of the forest, which were immaculate. And there was, it was just such an amazing feeling to be near the trees. Um, I would be just driving down the road and see a grouping and stop and paint them. Um, there were some spots that, you know, I was targeting to try to get into, but they were, it was such an enormous situation um, that I knew I was going to have to accomplish that in the studio, um, that I wasn't going to be able to do it with these small masonite boards that I had. So um, I did my best to just, you know, have fun. <laughs> um, and then I used all of these paintings when I got back to my studio uh, to work from. Um, that was sort of the point of my project. Uh, I wanted to capture the in real life experience and then use that uh, to make, you know, more synthetic paintings where I used a little bit more analysis of my experience um, and what I observed on other levels um, once I got back to my studio. And um, there were a lot of lakes, as I said, there were a lot of spots that I began to favor. And uh, this is an evening um, shot. I was actually having dinner in a restaurant that was overlooking this um, place called Orbaden. And there was this incredible lake. You'll see it in the next few pictures. Um, the bathers always sort of looked like this, um, knee deep in the water. And the reason for that is because it, the water was extremely cold and very few people went under, um, but people would walk around in it. And that was just a, you know, something I guess I had never quite seen before, like just people standing in the water. There's another shot. Um, this is the beautiful lake that I, ended up making a, a large, two large paintings from. This is another swimming hole that I frequented near my, the house I was staying at, um, a little bit more family oriented. Um, there was a camping ground on site. The Swedes, um, from what I can tell, camp a lot and they rent these little houses, like tiny houses and just stay outside together. Um, it's really lovely. So I made uh, you know, a bunch of, I was so worried that this particular group thought I was a creep because um, <laughs> I was like always sitting in the grass um, trying not to let, you know, invade their privacy. But um, there were some very beautiful moments that I had fun painting. Mm. 
actually sat behind this like tall grass and um, one day I was like, oh, I should show the perspective of where I'm actually sitting. This is a very small one. Um, the same lake near my house or the house that um, I was staying at. Um, this is after the sun has slipped. So just like in the Hudson River um, experience of mine, um, one of the coolest things about painting at night and painting while the sun is out and the sky is really dramatic is when it actually just slips down below the horizon, everything gets brighter. Um, I'm sure all of you have noticed that, but um, I love that moment. And um, I, uh, you know, feel very comfortable being out in the light then and painting, but it, it, in, you know, this climate in New York, that then soon turns to really dark pretty fast, but not in Sweden in the summer. So um, back in the studio, I um, gathered all my paintings, put them out and started to, you know, I had my books with me and I started to look at artists that came to mind. Um, obviously Monk is such an obvious um, reference, but I've always loved his work. And I love the shapes and the light. And um, there's so much about his work that I love. Um, and I just, you know, immediately went to um, his work and I started to do transcriptions of, of um, combinations of my experience and either particular paintings or just artists that I was looking at, just kind of combining everything to kind of figure out how I was going to unfold all this information into a new vocabulary. Um, and this is just a small painting I did. Um, the landscape is from where I was, and um, but obviously I think influenced by, you know, my looking at Monk. Um, and these were just sort of like sketches I was doing. Um, this is a Monk drawing. Um, I love how he incorporates the figure into the landscape. And this is probably where I started thinking like, how do you, you know, balance this, these two powerful ideas and, you know, human versus nature, <laughs> um, human with nature. Um, Sickert was another artist. I honestly think that happened because I was teaching a marathon and we were looking at Sickert, but then, um, you know, I was very attracted to his, um, somber colors and the, um, you know, some of the erotic imagery um, as I perceived it. Um, it just interested me now because I was thinking about, you know, not just, oh, the light on the landscape, but, you know, the consequences of, you know, having a daytime uh, situation that lasted so long, the vulnerability of it um, the anxiety that it created. Um, it was like a pleasure and a pain at the same time. Um, and how do you get comfortable when the light is so bright? How do you wind down? Uh, how do you have intimate moments? Um, there was the, where I was staying, there was this, um, this is Van Gogh. I'm always looking at Van Gogh's drawings of landscapes, but, um, I was making my students do, um, reproductions, like group uh, transcriptions of these really complicated, I was like using them because I really wanted to see like how they were interpreting all these marks um, and which was exciting. And I was doing the same, um, you know, I was enjoying, uh, you know, then just putting together these paintings. So there was, you know, a desire also to um, understand, you know, abstract ideas that I, you know, in composition and contrast and color, um, just how I was threading the canvas with information, which was representational, how I was using space, 
this is the one painting that represents that one second that the light actually gets dark in the summer and then back up to bright in the wee hours of the morning. Um, the archipelago I visited on, on my way out of Sweden and I did a lot of drawings while I was there too um, that inspired paintings. Um, I've always been interested in two bodies making one form um, and how they connect. And Sweden is sort of like that. It's like a lot of little islands and uh, lakes that all connect into this one beautiful country. I also was having a moment with the color blue, um, which I'm not through with. Um, I was realizing that I was using a lot of blue and I was, a little bit torn about it, but then I just decided to go for it. <laughs> um, so there's a strong palette in this group of work. Um, it's just a quick sketch I did uh, for this painting. Because you paint blue long enough and then all of a sudden you're like, I need to see bright yellow or something. Um, this painting also sort of encapsulates the the tensions and the um, mystery and the illumination um, all tied up in one. Okay, back to Orbaden, um, because this is a, was a big, strong, uh, this area was a big part of the imagery that I ended up creating this lake. Um, I will just say that um, what was so exciting about this from an architect's perspective, I guess, is that I'm standing on this cliff um, and there's like a steep drop to the beach and then it just unfolds in front of you. And then there's this wall of trees. And I found this particular area just, I was like, oh, I, I did so many little paintings and drawings from this area. And I knew this was going to be a special place for me. Um, because it had all the elements I wanted that could help set up some abstract ideas of how to play with space and um, the thrill of space and what it can do and then how you can translate it into two dimension. So this was a plein air painting. And this really nice guy um, drove by on his bike, this older man, and he said, um, he said that I did a good job on this painting. Um, the, actually, the Swedes were very kind. Um, they would sort of leave you alone, but then they would, you know, they they were just, you know, they would uh, tell you you were doing a good job, um, or the ones I ran into. And <laughs> um, this is the beach during the day. I did go under the water here, but it was painful. This is me in the studio. Um, my camera was probably falling, and I was trying to take a picture. Um, but this is how uh, one of the paintings started. It was um, just big shapes. And, th you know, first 30 minutes of any painting is probably the best, most fun. Um, and this painting, like, you know, in the studio, I all these paintings um, had a lot, you know, the process of making them, each one was different. I, I learned a lot making all these paintings. I tried different things. In this particular painting, it was a process of layering. Um, this is how it turned out. Um, just layering, 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 weaving together the space as I experienced it. Um, and then at the, it w actually had no figures in it until the very end. Um, and then I wove the, like, tried to, you know, have them almost be like a perpendicular to all this verticality just through her hair and their connection being more lateral, horizontal um, on the bottom. But I almost don't know if I needed to put them in, but. Um, I'm kind of glad I did, um, but yeah, all the verticals and then the horizontals, it was just like super fun to make this painting. Uh, that's how the scale of it. And this is the other, uh, sunset at Orbaden. Um, Klimt was another artist. I actually, is he, um, didn't do any transcriptions of Klimt's work because I just don't know how he made these paintings, to be honest. I, 
can't even fathom. Um, I don't think I could make, I don't know. Um, but I found this wonderful quote in a book where I found these images and I related to it so strongly that this helped me um, in making my large force painting. Um, and I'll read it to you. It, in, I don't know who wrote this, but it, um, it, it goes like this. Um, Klimt was studying the rhythms and balances in nature that appealed to the human eye and soul. Something about being in nature, surrounded by the sculpturally complex yet calming forms of trees seemed good for everyone. So while I was there, I tried to draw these dense forests um, and not so dense. I love that quote about um, he was studying the rhythms and balances in nature that appealed to the human eye and soul. And that was, that's always my experience when I'm in the, you know, painting trees. Um, uh, so um, this was the beginning of this large forest painting I was going to create. I was going to test it out, uh, which never do that because you always end up making the real thing. <laughs> so use good uh, I used good canvas, but I didn't stretch it up at first. Um, I was using black and white acrylic paint. And I thought, you know, I've never really painted abstractly. And I feel like this is the time to do it. And I was just going to go for it. And I was like, put the music on, had big brushes, house brushes, um, house paint brushes. And then the color started creeping in. Um, and then I ended up with that. <laughs> which makes me laugh because it, I really did want to make this like beautiful, like Franz Klein looking painting. Um, but what I experienced in the process was that the representation could be a wonderful tool in the abstraction. Um, and uh, yeah, I just had so much fun. I just wanted to create, um, to bring the experience of what I had there. I wanted to create, you know, I remember holding onto those trees and I tried to make something that was life-size, like the exact size of what it would be in real life. And I wanted it to feel like you could just step right into it. And I thought, how nice would that be to have in your house, like a forest from Sweden <laughs> that you could just walk right into anytime you want um, and have it be big enough to, you know, um, hold you in there. Um, and I did other, um, this painting, when I had my opening, I had uh, installed this show in my studio and my friends, I never get opinions on my work um, while I'm uh, painting usually. Um, I should probably do that more, but um, all my friends let me know that, you know, they felt that this tree and this, um, the play of the space was sort of jumping back and forth for them. And, um, you know, this is probably because of the colors that I was choosing. Um, there was this Jack Witten quote um, that I almost want to add to um, that someone told me once. I think it's pretty accurate that um, space is a feeling and it's the artist's job to make an object out of it. Oh, I will say with these, um, well, I'll just keep going. Uh, yeah, so this is um, drawings at Orbaden, um, the final painting. There were two kids, it was late. I had just been talking to my mom on the phone and then I just sat and did that drawing and was able to make a huge painting out of it. And then this, uh, another drawing I did after that one, it was, um, it was like nighttime, but there were people still in the water. And I made a equal size painting. Um, this is the other painting. There's something really wild happening in the sky and then reflecting in the water. And uh, this is my, <laughs> some installation shots just so you can see the size of things. Um, it's uh, a working studio with a show installed in it. Um, 
the night I opened the show, it was um, cleaner. This was sort of while I was setting it up. Um, but these are the, the lighting's a little funny too, but the scale of everything. And that is it. Um, okay, thank you for, uh, for attending this talk. Um, I'd love to get any questions you might have um, about the show. Yeah, thank you so much, Charity. I love that. Yeah, exactly. You can stop screen sharing. I loved that. I especially, I'm glad that you talked about your background in architecture. That's something I've always wondered because I noticed that you never paint buildings or structures. So I was curious how architecture plays a role in your paintings. And I thought that was super interesting. We do have a few questions rolling in. Uh, this one is from Annie and she asks, are your plein air paintings done in oil? And can you talk a little bit about how you arrived at your medium of choice? Yeah. Um they are all in oil, um, which is uh, surprising because of the nature of how fast things change when you're, a lot of people paint in oil outside, but um, yeah, that just was my first experience um, as an artist. Um, that's how I was, that was the medium I was taught, but I gravitated towards it too. I was always sort of in love with oil paint. Mm -hmm. And then um, going off of that question, when you were showing us the in-progress shots of that large forest painting, you started with acrylic. And is that because you were kind of going for the, um, you know, abstraction? And is that why you were using acrylic? Or how did, do you often start with acrylic? No. Um, okay. Actually, I uh, had just taught a marathon with Graham Nixon. Uh, you, it was a marathon about acrylic paint. And I had, was, you know, sort of painting um, on the side while I was teaching and experimenting with acrylic. And it, you know, it seems like it would be the perfect paint for me because of the, you know, how quickly it dries. And then I can, um, so I thought here, you know, I'm just going to go for it and make a huge acrylic painting. And, and then I just halfway through, I just switched to yeah, the oil. Okay, thank you. This next question is from Michelle. Um, when you use your small plein air paintings as references for studio paintings, can you describe what it is that they give you? What do you get from your small paintings that you don't get from your photos or visual memories? Um, well, I think that the marks I make when I'm drawing, um, and I'm talking about drawing now, in, in, um, inform sometimes my painting. Um, and then I think the same, like with, it's not that I wanna, um, I don't use photographs um, very once in a while, I try to experiment with it, but what I wanna get mostly is what my sensation was being there. And if I make a choice to mix a color and apply a paint in a certain thickness, I feel like that's more honest for me to work from than a photograph. Um, not that I have anything against photography. In fact, I'm actually starting to experiment with, you know, the sources of my looking um, and how that gets revealed into my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This one is from Amanda and it goes back to your materials. Materials. Do you generally draw with crayons or colored pencils or neither? Oh, um, I usually draw, I do everything. Um, I love Conti crayons. <laughs> and charcoal but yeah right before I went to Sweden um I started a drawing club with a friend and I started just so we had to do a drawing every day and I just for some reason I have all these colored pencils and I just decided to draw from my paintings um and that's how it started and now I totally draw with colored pencils uh, and I did for this trip too Thank you. This question is from Anne, and I'm glad she asked it because I was going to bring it up as well. Can you talk about the intimacy of the figures, the kiss, intimate with the landscape, with each other, but it's so unusual to see those kisses. You mentioned Sickert's eroticism. I guess I just want to understand their role more. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
Well, um, <laughs> do you feel like do you feel like the intimacy is somehow drawn out from the intensity of the sun? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I was dealing, you know, um, okay, so this is this is a good way to to put it. Um, I think that for one thing, just form, okay, there's a couple of things, but formally it's like, um, I didn't want to bring too much attention on one person um, because it wasn't about portraiture. It was just about human beings and nature just together. And which is something I experienced in, in Sweden in general, um, understanding their culture. It just seems like a place where people really enjoy being in nature and the kissing sort of prevented the paintings from being about a specific person, but um, also it was autobiographical on some level. And um, also just when you are kissing, um, because I was painting, you know, skies and these forests that would just envelop you, um, I feel like that is the feeling you have when you are kissing. You kind of leave material world, you know, and um, I felt like this extreme light situation, um, you know, in some ways for me was like surreal. Uh, and that's why I sought after it. Um, and it just, they felt very hand in hand um, for me. That's the best I could probably explain it. That was helpful, thank you. <laughs> Um, this next question is, could you talk about the relationship that is evolving with the paintings being back in New York City coming from Swedish context and what possible conversation this is starting? It's definitely started a lot of conversation. Um, and I'm really glad I put myself in this position because um, I wanted to, you know, uh, I want to always be asking myself interesting questions about painting. Um, a lot came up about everything, color, abstraction, representation, um, composition, um, subject, um, scale, all these basic considerations with painting. Why am I painting this? Um, what am I painting? Um, and then for me, because this was a very experiential, um, endeavor, um, putting myself physically in a place, um, you know, for me with painting, it's, I, it mostly, uh, is about how I feel like in front of my painting, um, you know, color, uh, the right colors or color in general, or, or even just drawing, um, you know, and this goes back to the architecture. It's like, how do I feel in this space? Like, how do I feel, with the amount of daylight I'm letting into this room or how would that feel? And how does it feel when you're outside and how does it feel to be inside? And, um, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully that answers it. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> um, this next question is, there is such a sense of awe in your paintings, which comes with what you have chosen to paint. Does the cultivated or designed landscape interest you, especially in relation to the figure? Um, can you repeat that? I'm not yes, sure. Absolutely. There is a sense of awe in your paintings, which comes with what you have chosen to paint. Does the cultivated or designed landscape interest you, especially in relation to the figure? You've um, talked a lot about how the figure, how you sort of balance the figure in your landscapes. And yeah. It's so interesting. And maybe just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm glad that you asked that question because then that means that my interests are coming across um, and that is what I'm interested in. I've always been like that. When I formally started studying painting at the New York Studio School, we would have like models in the room and I, it was like how I felt when I would get a new design project in architecture. I was like, how much of the figure am I gonna show in this painting? where are they going to be like what's the light you know and i would just it was like um i don't know like you know just setting up quest problems for yourself to solve for me it, it really does a lot of times have to do with composition um composing how i'm putting all the elements together that are in front of me on this given size of whatever i'm working on so 
Totally. Thank you. Um, Suzanne made a comment, which I think is really apt. She said, there's a dreamlike and fantasy quality, even though your paintings have clear subjects, not easy to accomplish. Do you resonate with sort of that fantasy and dreamlike element? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for saying that, actually. Um, I do. Um, I do think it's because um, of the way I think <laughs> um, in general and how I go through life. Um, I'm very curious about everything around me. And I, I think uh, sometimes I view things poetically. Um, and then I like that that comes across in the painting. So even if I'm just painting what I'm looking at, I hope to, ex you know, that's sort of why I paint because I like my thoughts <laughs> sometimes and I want to share them. Um, yeah, absolutely. You talked a little bit about abstraction, especially in that large forest painting, which is right behind you. And you were discussing how you wanted to create sort of a purely abstract painting and that didn't end up happening exactly. But I do see a lot of abstraction in your works. And I wondered if you could talk about how abstraction does play a role in your paintings, even if they're not purely non-representational or purely abstract. How do you think about abstraction in your work? Um, I think it's really important to me. It mm -hmm. might be one of the most important things. Um, and by abstraction, um, I might mean, gosh, I might mean like, design in a way. Um, that might be a bad word to say. It's like taking what you're looking at and then making, I think it sort of goes back to that Jack Whitten quote of that mm -hmm. space is a feeling and it's our job to make an object out of it. And not that that's the correct thought to have about art, but I there's something about that comment that really stuck with me because I was thinking, I do try to make something out of you know, I try to take what exists or a thought or whatever, and then make something out of it that I can show you and be like, the biggest compliment that I would get as an artist would be for somebody to say, um, you know, that my painting, that they like, have never seen it that way, but they understand, like that they uh, already know what I'm like. I had this one woman once come, I had a painting of a forest in a group show and she's like, I've never seen trees like that before. She's like, it's like, I know what your painting is. I know it, but I've never seen it like that before. But I also understand, like, I know it, what you did. And she had this realization that, you know, that maybe she had come across a new language to describe something that she already knew. Um, and that's my, any artist's goal, I think, especially, abstract and representational. Mm -hmm. I love that. And what you just said made me think of your painting Birch, which really creates this interesting optical illusion. And it was immediately one of my favorite paintings, but it took me about two weeks to actually see that the white space was the birch tree. And in my mind, the green was coming forth. Yeah. And then all of a sudden my mind made this flip-flop and that was so interesting. And I think there's a lot of abstraction in that painting. Um, yeah. Some figurative elements, of course. Yeah, that's a good example of the abstraction that I was seeking. Um, right, certainly. And you've discussed tension and Patty has a question about that. Can you talk about the tension in your work between actual 2D space and the illusion of pictorial space? Yeah. Um, how can I talk about that? Mm -hmm. I think, um, hmm. well, it is a goal of mine to have 2D and 3D merge um, into the sublime <laughs> if I can. So, um, you know, that there requires some back and forth with that. Um, you know, and it really depends on the rectangle of the canvas and the color. And like I said, um, like in Birch, it's a really good example of a piece. Um, there's a, um, you know, there's a figure right in the foreground and 
I made that in profile and it just like trying to layer the space um, two dimensionally, um, which is representing something three dimensional, um, just playing with stuff like that. And, you know, you'd be surprised it, that painting, I worked on it so much. Um, I even ruined my shoes making that painting, believe it or not. Like my, <laughs> like I went through so much pain to make that little painting. Um, Charity, do you think you could quickly pull it up on your screen? Oh, sure. Again? Yeah. I just want to make sure everybody has it fresh in their mind. Yeah. It's a little painting, but it packs a big punch. I really love it. Yeah, there it is. It's not very big. Um, I think this one is 20 by 16. Yeah. I can even show you. Yeah. So people thought this green was the tree. Right. And this was like a swamp land behind and it's called birch. So <laughs> no, it's funny God, how man. it just made that switch in my mind all of a sudden, but I yeah. have seen it a completely a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these are the trees in the background. So right. that's the far space. And then the near space is the ear lobe. But also, uh, if we're just, we stay on this for one more second. Oh, sure. um, I love how you were sort of talking about um, placing figures in shadow and darkening their features. And I think it adds so much drama. And we really see that in this painting. I love that highlight on the ear and the eyebrow. Um, but I feel like that's another tool to sort of abstract the figure and maybe make them meld into the landscape mm -hmm. with the lighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is like, it was a three-dimensional endeavor that I worked out two-dimensionally, I guess. Um, the, you know, that it, it went through, a, the painting went through a lot. I mean, it was a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then down to the last decision was the green, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, I need to ramp this up. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, I love this painting. It's one of those works that continues to give as you look at it. Yeah. Thanks. Should I stop? Yes, you can. I just wanted to pull that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also curious, since you teach so often, um, you mentioned how you sort of used your students to see how they interpreted something, which I think is super interesting. And do you feel like you learn from your students or oh, does yeah. teaching propel your work? Yeah, I, um, I try not to enforce my agenda on them, mm -hmm. um, except I did that day. <laughs> um, but also I think Van Gogh is just such an incredible draftsman. Mm -hmm. And I want, this assignment was a good one uh, mm -hmm. for them um, because we were, you know, I, one of the things I stress is like, use the whole page, like enjoy this, you know, own this, uh, this piece of paper you're working on totally. So by doing the transcription of that, you know, he had done that. And um, it was just this variation of abstract marks basically that create something so specific um, like grass, um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, I knew that was a challenging one, but they, they trust me, I feel like, and, and um, we, I think they were all like blown away when we finished it. It was pretty beautiful because right. uh, they all had a little piece of it and then oh, we that's so put cool. it on the wall, it was huge. Uh, I love and, that. Yeah. And then we put the model in front of it. Um, mm -hmm to pose in it. So, cause then I wanted them to have the, had the experience of using the whole page and then, you know, but then they just went right for the head. Like we all do <laughs> when we have a model anywhere, right. um, but it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I love teaching. It's great. Okay. This question is what is a typical day like in your studio? Do you have a routine? Also, how long do you work on a painting? Um, it varies like those plein air paint. I can spend one hour on a painting. I, time is totally an element in my work. Um, some paintings are very fast. I like to paint fast, but then I li like the big tree painting was amazing. That was maybe the best, the highlight of January for me, because I, that's all, that was like my job. So like, I just came to the studio every day with my coffee and I just stayed all, you know, for whatever, eight hours 
and just painted like day after day. I did it until I finished it. Um, and it was like, I felt like I was in heaven. Um, I had nothing else to worry about. And, you know, that it, it, it varies because we all have to, you know, survive and life and all that. But um, I realized that the best thing I can probably do for myself is to block out like chunks of time where I can surrender to the, the studio. Cause that's, you know, I like when I paint a lot, cause I feel like uh, it's better than painting a little every once in a while. Um, so I do go sometimes like for a while without painting and then I'll paint a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you. This question is from Mike. How do you decide when to put figures in your more invented pieces? Are they based on real people? Yeah, they usually are actually. <laughs> um, I, my work is very like autobiographical actually, um, but I don't think that's important um, for you to know necessarily um, because I do try to, I remember, yeah, I, I feel like I'm using yeah, the people I know inspire me. So I like to paint people I know very much. And some people inspire me more than other people. So it's just a who knows who's going to inspire me. <laughs> like people become muses for me and I, I get obsessed like with certain people. Um, you know, and it's not always the people I'm the closest to. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's, I think it's the mystery of the muse. Um, <laughs> and that is alive and well in my paintings for sure. I love that. I love the intensity of your figures and they often don't recall specific people. Um, they feel a bit more universal. And sometimes there's so much ambiguity in them. They can look androgynous. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah. They make them feel very accessible and like you can insert, the viewer can insert herself into the figures and yeah. become the figures. I think I'm not interested in individuals as much as humans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for painting purposes. Yeah, I like, I like how you said that. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we are nearly done, but I just want to ask you um, two quick questions. Is Midnight Sun still an ongoing project? Are you continuing to create paintings inspired by the Midnight Sun? Yeah, I, I actually am. Um, and just when I thought I was finished with blue, um, I am actually today going to start a new painting that's going to be the color of my shirt. Um, and it's going to be very large, <laughs> um, that I'm so, so excited about. And it's that time when, yeah, the sun is not in the sky anymore, but it's very lovely blue. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's going to continue. I have this residency in Northern Wales this summer, which I think will be interesting. Um, I'll do a lot of landscape painting there, and then I might try to go to Sweden for a little bit, um, around that time. And I have other ideas too, but. Yeah. Amazing. Well, that was going to be my next question, which was you were just awarded this exciting residency in Wales. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's going to be another opportunity to immerse yourself in a fresh landscape. And um, I can't wait to see what you create there. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, that's an example, like having a month, it's a month mm -hmm. um, to just not be distracted with my life. Um, mm -hmm is such a gift and I'm so, so grateful for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I learned a ton from your talk and I just think it created this amazing context for what you're doing. A couple words. Um, we have a beautiful printed exhibition catalog of the paintings in Midnight Sun. You can purchase one through our website. And I just wanna reiterate that in addition to the gallery's online presentation of the show, all of the paintings are beautifully installed in Charity's studio, which is located within the New York Studio School. I'd love to help um, get people there in person. So if you're interested in setting up an in-person viewing, you can reach out to the gallery or directly to Charity and we will coordinate a time so that you can see the work in person. And the show is on view through March 31st.
Yeah, please let um, reach out to me on, you can even on Instagram direct message me and be happy to have you come over to this, to see everything. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you all so much for attending the talk and thank you Lillian for beautifully curating the show and providing this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your weekends.